you do something that is super hard and you overcome it. And then you know that you can overcome many other things. So this short, you can say, interval of stress that you have will be broken and you will open up your mind for, okay, if I can do this, then I can do many things. One of the key rules as an interviewer is never to talk about yourself. But when I first discovered your protocol, I gave it a go because I was fascinated by it. But Dr. Soberg, I can't do it. I cannot stand that that moment. It fills me with dread. I would rather do anything else apart from fully submerge myself in cold water. Why do some people hate it more than others? Is there a, is there a reason why that other than just a psychological reason? And secondly, is it a case that the people that are more reluctant to do it could potentially benefit more? I'm trying to see if there's a relationship between getting a greater physiological or, or mental health benefit the, the less you want to go in and do it in the first place. Have you got any insight on that? <laughs> I think that is a really good question. Well, I can use myself as a, an example. So the more you reject the cold, the more you probably need it also. Right. Yeah. I was worried you were going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> it is like the the more you reject it is probably because you uh, reject the stress so you don't like stress nobody really likes stress even the short-term stress but you can get used to it and you can widen that window for how much stress that you can take in both physically but also mentally so if you get used to that you can say pain of doing this deliberately it's kind of a pain painful thing to do but you get used to that and you learn yourself that you can manage the pain. You can breathe yourself through this pain so you can calm your nervous system and teach yourself that you can overcome a stressful situation. So this helps you both physically to overcome the, the, the very low threshold for pain that you have and increase that, but also mentally. So it's really funny how this works both as a window for your capacity to cope with stress in general um, mentally, but also how much you can cope with it physically. So today, just to take myself again, uh, is, is really much easier for me to go out in the cold and do cold water immersion. So just go out when it's cold. I don't always have to like have it all be completely packed in, uh, in, in sweaters and and warm jackets. I mean, it's, I can have my jacket open, even if it's very cold in Denmark. So often we, of course, close it, but I can ha leave it open up more today than I could before. So I do feel that the, the, there's been a shift in how much cold I, uh, I can take before I feel that it's stressful to me. And I do think that someone maybe like you, I don't know how much you have done cold water immersions, but people would benefit from this because it also increases their um, you can say self-belief. You do something that is super hard and you overcome it. And then you know that you can overcome many other things. So this short, you can say, interval of stress that you have will be broken and you will open up your mind for, okay, if I can do this, then I can do many things. A lot of people won't have tried it and, and then there'll be that trepidation which is putting them off. What are the, the easy ways to introduce yourself to this? I'm thinking maybe a, a cold shower or alternating a cold shower with a hot shower. What are the other easy introductory steps that someone very new to this could take? Yes, okay. yeah, a cold shower is definitely a good way to get started. If you are, um, if you are rejecting the cold very much and you think that it's too big a thing to just step into an ice bath, that is... For me, for me, it would have been too much, definitely. But a cold shower could be a way to get started. It will not be the same as doing a cold water immersion, but it, it's a good way to get started. So you can end your hot showers uh, on the cold, uh, five seconds, and try to build it up to 30 seconds. But you can also get used to the cold by putting cold water to the face. It will also not substitute for the cold um, water uh, immersions but it will be a way for your for yourself to get used to how does this cold feel um maybe hand cold baths <laughs> and and foot baths could also do it that will definitely activate your brown fat so in that way you can also prepare a bit 
I've always, whenever I've done any kind of cold treatment, I've always ended with a really hot blast because otherwise I feel like I'm going to be cold for hours afterwards and it just takes away that edge. But obviously that goes against the so-called Sobo principle where you need to end on cold. Why is it so important to end on cold? And, and what are the detrimental effects if you don't, if you do what I do and go back to hot afterwards? How much of the benefits do I eliminate? Yeah, well, people don't need to end on the cold. I think that is maybe it's a bit advanced. I don't know. But why I have studied this metabolism and during I called it a bit of a nerdy phase where I was studying what happens to the body when you expose yourself to the cold. And what I figured was that if you are cold after your winter swim, your cold water immersions, then you will force your body to heat up by itself. And that is the sober principle, because when you do that, you will increase your metabolism for hours afterwards. If you are new to this and you just start out and say, well, I'm going to follow the sober principle, then you will increase your metabolism for long term uh, afterwards, not only the few minutes that you're in the cold water. And this is this is super helpful for you, right? For your metabolism. That is like a, a, an after workout where you don't have to do anything. It's just your body working itself up to the right temperature again. I find that so applicable and I th find it so feasible for people to do if they can just figure out a way to keep moving afterwards. That I think that is important. So moving afterwards, you can go home, you can clean, just don't sit down on the couch because if you do that, you will have what is called the after drop and then you will start shivering in the sofa. Not that it's dangerous in that sense, but it's just uh, uncomfortable and that might give you the idea that this was not a great idea <laughs> to to do this. So I, um, I always advise people to keep moving afterwards because that is also healthy. So it's kind of like... Um, exercise post your um co-war immersions yeah and and very quickly where, where would your advice be for somebody to begin if they do want to go in could you talk a little bit about the optimal protocol that the people should should adopt as a starting place when they want to explore this field yeah first of all i think that people should uh, should go and take my beginners course because i have made a course where i teach people the the house and why is on cold and heat and also the breath work. So the breathing part is, of course, a very important steering wheel to lower your nervous system. But you can also do it on your own if you are ready to do that. And uh, what I advise is 11 minutes per week, which I saw in my studies, 11 minutes per week divided on two to three days and also alternating with sauna. And I think that is really, really important part of it as well. If you want this health journey and um, you want to start that. So that is 57 minutes of sauna per week, also divided on two to three days. So if you are not able to alternate, you can also divide it on different days. That is also, of course, okay, but I can't say <clears throat> exactly how does that differ in outcomes compared to what I have done because that study is not done. So that's that's been brilliant. I think it was really nice as well. The the, the whole holistic approach. I think thanks to social media and Instagram, there's a lot of really buff guys jumping into ice buckets and it's all a bit raw. But actually as you said, it's the breath work. And when I have done it and I've managed to do it for a little bit, it's almost that me that meditative effect. It's it's the opposite of macho. It's taking a it's taking your breath. It's thinking about things. It's getting some perspective and then jumping out and going, do you know what? Nothing I do today is going to be as hard as this. And it's resilience. You touched upon that self-awareness. And for me, it was it gave me a sense of purpose and a belief that, do you know what, I can do anything that pops up today. And I think that's where the benefit came from. I didn't enjoy it, but I can absolutely see the mental health benefits. Yeah, I think that is a really important benefit that you just touched upon there, because when people are, are worried it is not easy to get out of your mind, right? You cannot you cannot just park that and say, well, I'm not going to worry anymore. But what you can do is something physical. You can do, you can go and exercise. That is also a great thing. But you can go and shock your body, and that's going to take you out of that uh, worries because the body cannot concentrate on surviving and think about your worries about what's going to happen in five years or tomorrow or whatever, uh, or what you're going to shop uh, in, in a few hours. You cannot think about anything else, just being in that moment. During that moment, you have that increase in neurotransmitters in the brain, which will make you more positive to whatever worries you have when you then go up. So that in, in a physiological sense, you, you will actually be at a better state of thinking about whatever you had on your mind. So if you want to have a more positive mindset, 
definitely, if that is all you want to get out, out of your cohort emotions, that is definitely something you will have um, on a short term. So short term effects, there are definitely uh, something for your mental health, but also probably also for, for the long term.